Okay. Um, I think I'm recording. Yes. Okay. So, uh, hi everybody. Thanks for showing up. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk today about the the way that Rust C represents types. And I'm curious for those of you who are here. Have any of you written code in Rust C before that used types? I know Santiago, you did a little bit at least. You may not know you did, <laughs> but or are we all starting from scratch? Okay, awesome. Uh, so I probably threw in terms that you don't know. We'll come across them. Feel free to stop me. Um, let's start with the kind of basic thing. When I talk about how Rusty represents types, there's actually a lot of types in the compiler. And if you just look, I'm talking sort of around this, this type we call ty. And we, we made it short because you know we type it a lot. Um, and if you just look for like things named ty in the compiler, some of these are methods, but yeah, you'll already see there's there's actually quite a few. Um, so the one I'm specifically talking about is Rusty tie tie, <laughs> and not here tie. And let me explain the difference. Um, so the here, first of all, the here in Rust is sort of our, our high level IR. It's kind of our AST. There's a couple stages, but it basically represents the syntax that the user wrote, right? Um, so the result of parsing. And after some amount of desugaring and so on. And it has a representation of types, but that really represents the syntax that the user wrote. So it's exactly what did they write to represent that type. And one way to, I think they try to explain the difference uh, of between that and what and the and the rusty tie ties that we're gonna focus on is looking at like look at this function, for example. Here I have this type u32, and it appears twice. Right? But we know that that's, in some sense, the same type. It, it takes an argument and returns an argument of the same type. But from the point of view of the here, there would be two distinct type instances, because these are occurring at two different places in the program. They have two different spans, so like two different locations, um, and so on. Right? And there might be information that's left out, like this type, ampersand u32, reference to u32, uh, it's kind of incomplete, right? In the full Rust compiler, there's actually a, a lifetime here, or a region as we often call it in the compiler, but we didn't write it. And there's some sort of defaulting rules, right? Like if I had this signature, um, there's elision rules that would, that would kind of insert the equivalent of uh, of this, right? And in the here level, these things are, are not yet all spelled out. But in the tie level, it's complete. And moreover, for something like U32, we'll have exactly one type, because it doesn't, it's does not connected to a specific spot in the program. It's more the abstract notion of the type itself, right? Um, so, so this is the type, I'm saying that it describes the semantics of the type in this sense. And you can actually, you know, click on it and see how it's defined. Um, it's actually a type alias. And we're going to get into this lifetime, but for now I want to just sort of ignore it. Um, and you see that a type is a reference to a structure creatively called tie s. I don't know, I guess that's for type structure. Um, and this, this type structure is where the actual data is, right? So basically we're passing around pointers to we're going to see that these get interned, like allocated in the special pool. We'll come back to that. We're passing around references or pointers to these structs. And this is the actual fields of a type. There's three things here. Um, the one that matters most and that we'll spend most of our time on is the STY for structured type, I guess. And the other two, the flags and the outer exclusive binder, I don't know if we'll talk about those, but they basically summarize, they, they're kind of convenient hacks for efficiency that summarize information about the type that we might like to know. So I might come back to it. But most of the time when you work with a type in Rust, you might have uh, 
a variable or a function like this, most of the time you will you'll be writing code sort of like this that extracts out this STY field and matches on it. And why do I say match? Because what this STY field stores is something called a type kind. And uh, this is kind, if you're familiar with like um, Haskell terminology and or functional programming or that, or that sort of not nomenclature, this is not that sort of kind. This is just the kinds of types that we have. That's what it means, like the different sort, sorts. So it's all the different variants. There could be Booleans, characters, you know, these should look kind of familiar too. These are like the Rust type system written out. Um, some of them might be a little surprising, right? So Booleans, characters, integers. If you go ahead and click on inti, you'll see that it's like all the different things that you might expect. Um, those are pretty obvious, but some of them are less obvious. So an ADT, that stands for abstract data or algebraic data type, sorry. Uh, and you can see that it basically means a struct, an enum, or a union, all of those are represented as the same variant for us because they're kind of all variations on a theme. It's basically a user-defined type um, in some sense. And we'll come back to this, the details of what's in here, but, but this would represent a reference to a struct, like vec of u32 or something. That would be an ADT. Um, so foreign these corresponds to these extern types that are like experimental. Um, stir is the type stir. So when you have ampersand stir, for example, this is the stir of that. An array is this. So you kind of see that each case of the Rust, like where the Rust syntax has a type, there's a corresponding variant here. Um, raw pointers. One that's kind of interesting is ref. These stand for safe references. And it might be ampersand mute or ampersand t. Um, and they have some parts to them. This is the type that the reference references. This is the lifetime or region. We'll come back to that and the mutability. Okay, I'm gonna stop going down here because it's not that important. But you get the idea that you have all these variants uh, that correspond to the different types in the Rust language. Any questions on that so far? Okay, so there's a whole family of like related types that are in my mind grouped together um, that, that, that kind of represent different parts of the semantics of the type. And we kind of saw that already. There's stuff like uinti and inti, but ADT def, we'll come back to that one, substref, tie, const, um, or region. So we'll see some of these and I kind of plan to talk a little bit about all of them, but uh, but they're all kind of parts of the type in the end of the day. Um, so I mentioned this uh, when, I, when we were talking about the definition of tie. I said there was a lifetime TCX. We'll get into more detail about what that is, but I just want to talk about where these types live and how they're handled for a little bit. Um, so types in Rust-C are allocated from a global memory pool. If you're, if you're familiar with the term arena, we use an arena. And what it means is basically at the beginning of compilation, we make a buffer. And each time we need to allocate a type, we kind of use some of that memory buffer. And if we run out of space, we get another one. And um, the lifetime of that buffer, that's what this TCX is talking about. So. The idea is that when we finish compilation, we're gonna take that buffer and just free the whole thing really fast. Uh, and therefore any references, any types that we allocated from that memory buffer are invalid. So they're, they're tied to the lifetime of that buffer. And that's what this TCX is, is basically telling us. Um, so that's called, well, that's called a arena allocation. And then we further do a canonicalization step. So the idea is that we don't just, each time you want to construct a type, we don't just naively allocate from the buffer, but we look and see, have you already constructed this type once before? And if so, we'll give you the same pointer that, that, you, that you had before. And other times, otherwise we'll make a fresh pointer. And so that we're interning them. And that means that 
actually, if you want to know if two types are exactly the same and they're allocated from this arena, all you have to do is compare the pointers, uh, which is efficient. Right? And you can actually see that. So the tie S struct that represents types is only ever allocated. We never can, it's kind of carefully set up so that you never construct them just on the stack, right? Um, you always allocate them from this arena and you always intern them so that they're unique. And that means that we can define like partial EQ, just compare the pointers of two of them. Um, similarly, the hash just hashes the pointer. Right? Uh, so I'm not gonna at this moment dive in because it doesn't matter that much, but I'll probably come back to how this arena stuff is set up. Um, but suffice to say that there is a struct called context interners, and it has a lot of data, right? And one of the things it has is an arena. This is that buffer I was talking about, where we allocate things from the buffer. And then it has a bunch of hash maps. And these are how we make things unique, right? When we want to intern a type, for example, we look in the hash map to see, is there uh, already, you, you have some tie S that represents the type, and you look in the hash map to see, is, do we already have that a pointer to that exact tie S? And if so, we're going to return it. Um, any questions on that so far? Okay. So the, the existing documentation mentioned that uh, there are uh, two types of arenas, the global and the innermost, and that the innermost is used uh, for like local when you're inferring uh, like a specific type. Um, I assume that the global arena is allocated at the beginning of compilation and the local uh, arena is done for each type of inference. Yeah, I was uh, alighting that and I was going to come to it later, but might as well do it now. It's a good, it's a good question. So I, met, I talked about as if there was exactly one arena, but actually we have two, we have many arenas during compilation and as, as Aki mentioned, pointed. So there is one global arena that kind of lives for the whole compilation. And then when we're type checking or doing other things on a specific function, um, you often make a lot of throwaway types. We'll see later what I mean. But you end up with a lot of temporary types during type inference that are not um, really useful outside of that specific function necessarily. And so what we do is we create a temporary a local arena here. And those types that, that are specific to type checking get allocated in here. And types that are specific, types that are kind of global, like U32, get allocated here, right? Um, and so when you pass around a TCX, the TCX is the type context. It's kind of the omnipresent compiler state. Uh, you, when you pass around a TCX, it, it, it is sometimes kind of in one of these local arenas and sometimes not. Um, but uh, it, will, it will kind of pick which of the arenas to use based on the type that you're interning. So when you have a given type, you'll say, oh, this one has some state that is local to inference, I'll put it in the local arena, or it doesn't. Um, and we'll come back to that. All right. So let's talk about generics. Um, so imagine I define this generic struct, my struct T. When you have a reference to this struct in Rust, like a variable whose type is my struct or whatever, that reference never comes by itself. Right? Well, hold on. Let me say, let me back up and say one thing. Uh, Whenever the compiler um, assigns these special IDs, we call def IDs, and they're kind of assigned to everything that has a definition. Um, so in this example, there would be uh, at least two def IDs, actually more, depending, but at least two, right? So we would have one def ID that is just the def ID of this struct definition as a whole. And we would have one def ID, for example, for the type parameter, T. 
We would also have one for the field. We would not have a def ID for this U32 here. That's because that's not a definition. That's a reference to the type U32, but we're not defining the type U32 here. Um, so I'm going to use the term def ID a lot. But I wanted to kind of clarify what it is. It's basically an identifier. It's an integer um, that that uh, identifies something that we define somewhere. Um, it's an integer. It happens to map. We have an internal map that can go from a def ID to what's called a def path. A def path is kind of what it sounds like. It's a path through the, it's basically like a module path, um, only a little more rich. It might say like create foo my struct um, and identifies this particular definition uniquely. Um, it's a little different than a module path you can actually use in Rust because you know it might, for example, include like the type parameter t has a path like this, and you could not like name the type parameter t from Rust in that sense. Um, the reason to have these paths, these are used in incremental compilation. They kind of match up things between compilations. Um, but it doesn't matter too much. Basically, for everything, we have an ID. Uh, so that's that's what the def ID of a struct is. But now when we have an actual type, like when we use my struct as a type, it's never by itself. It's not just my struct. It also has together with it a set of type parameters, right? The value. So and it's basically the value for T. Um, and if you look at the definition of ADT that we saw earlier, uh, you will see here it is. Oh, it's kind of small. Let's make that bigger. Um, so you'll see that it has two parts. It has an ADT def and a substref. So, oopsie, what just happened? Okay. You still see my Dropbox paper here now, right? Okay, I did some dragging. So anyway, um, here's the two parts actually. So what these two parts are, the ADT def, that's like algebraic data type definition, um, basically specifies the struct, but without the type parameters. It's essentially a def ID. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between these and def IDs. But what it actually is, is it's an intern struct, um, interned in the same sense uh, as the types are interns are allocated in the global arena. And here we have a reference to it. And you can the TCX lifetime is kind of the telltale. If something has that lifetime, it's, it must be allocated in the arena, because that's what that's for. Um, uh, and it has some helper methods and some other things. So when you have one of these structs, you can ask things like, is this a, I don't know, whatever. Um, a lot of annoying stuff. Um, let me scroll up, actually. Oh, wait, what am I looking at? This is the wrong link. Okay, that link is wrong. Sorry. What that ADT def does. So I mentioned that here we were we were looking at a struct, uh, but I mentioned at some point that the ADT type is used for structs, enums, and unions. So we kind of in the compiler have a sort of unified view of things. You can think of a struct as being a lot like a one variant enum. Uh, you know, it has just like an enum, it has fields. It's just that there's only one possibility, um, and so. The ADT def in cap kind of lets you view all of those distinct things more uniformly. So it has a def ID, but then it has a list of variants. And for a struct, this will always be of length one. Uh, and for each one within the variant, it has some information about the variant, like the variant has a def ID as well, blah, blah, blah. What is its discriminant? And then it has a list of fields. Um, and these are basically the names of each field has an ID, and then it has a it has a type that's not stored in this struct. That's okay. Come back to it. But so that's what the ADT def is. It lets it kind of gives you some information, um, and you can get them. That's what that link is going to. You can get them. Yeah, you, there's a there's a way to construct an ADT def given a def ID. This is a query. I won't go into it. So. Okay, the substref, so what is that? So first of all, people often have trouble with this. We should probably rename it, but that's okay. What subst stands for substitutions, and ref, I guess, is just because it's a reference. And so what the substitutions are 
is it's basically a list of types that are meant to be substituted for the generic type parameters on a struct. So these are the replacements for these generic types. And actually, it's not just types, because uh, it could be region, it could be lifetimes or regions. But for now, we'll just talk about types. So in this case, it would be a list like U32. Um, and if you follow through this definition, you'll see it's got a certain amount of complexity. It's an internal subs, which is an alias for a list uh, of a kind. A kind is either a type or a region um, defined in a weird way. But this list, what is list? So a list is, it's basically a, a slice of data. Um, so this is a little bit fancy, but what this really is morally is this. Just to say it's an arena allocated slice of types. Um, and the, or actually a little more accurately, the slice of kinds. Uh, Um, and what I mean by kinds is they're either types or regions. So, right, so it's a slice. It has this, the difference is uh, we use this list, um, this kind of ampersand tick TCX list uh, kind. This is kind of what it really is if you play it out. And what that is, uh, let's see. Ah, yes. This has to do with the pointer equality and so on that I mentioned earlier. So the idea is a, this is like a, a list of things that we allocated in the arena. And the difference between a list and a slice is that you a list is the full list always. Whereas with a slice, you can get sub-slices. And it matters because you might imagine you had like uh, one list like this and one list like this, okay? These could be two different lists. Um, list A and list B, All right? But if we, and now if we wanna compare them for equality, because we know that they're the complete list and we, we interned it and hashed it and we have unique pointers, we can actually compare the pointers for equality. We don't have to dive in and iterate over the contents. But if we had just slices, I might, take a subslice of A um, I may have a subslice of A and the full list B and I might want to compare them for equality and if I just compared the pointers it would tell me that they're unequal but actually they're equivalent so that's why we, we use this other type because it can't be subsliced um, which is a a win because we can have more efficient uh, pointer operations, but also a, a loss because we can't subslice. <laughs> uh, which means that if you want to have a sublist, you have to like allocate it again. So that's how you represent these these my structs. Any questions about that so far? I have a slightly off-topic question regarding the ADT. Uh, you mentioned that in the compiler, uh, the ADT represents like a global view of uh, struct enums and units. Is that reflected in the parser grammar? In the sense that it distinguishes between them and then uh, generates like this kind of structure, or is it the other way around that the grammar just says, okay, I have either one of these, and then after what we do, the tech, they are just either one of these. So in Rust's grammar, we treat those three things very differently. Right, and if you look at the here, this is another difference between the here types and the, uh, well, not quite, but it's the difference between the here and the later phases of the compiler, right? The here is more like, hmm, this is a struct definition, this is an enum definition, there are distinct things. Uh, but then, then we, when we create the ADT def in this query that I talked about, um, it actually sort of makes a unified view of them. I look saying, oh, if it's a struct, let me give it a single variant. If it's an e or if it's an enum, uh, and the union, I think, is more the other way that they're sort of. I, I forget how unions are represented. I think they have also a single variant, but you could imagine them being 
actually all variants of their own. Uh, I, I think we have only a single variant. But um, yeah, so that, that, that translation happens. That's exactly a good example, of, I think, of the translation from syntax to the semantics I'm talking about. Um, Thank you. Okay, so I want to talk a bit about this subst a little more. I talked about, I said that these are the substitutions. Uh, if you're familiar with, if you've like played with type systems, that might be familiar too, but if not, it's worth discussing. So the, we have a notion of sort of substituted and unsubstituted generics. Um, so here I talked about the type U32 as the value for T, but inside the definition of my struct, I might reference T directly, right? And when I'm inside this definition, I don't really know what T is. I'd have to treat it like it's a, a placeholder, right? For any type. Um, and so we need a way just to talk about these, these uh, generic types that are not yet known. And there is indeed a variant for that. So if you go to uh, this, this list of variants, what's it called, Thai kind? Yeah. Um, one of them is called param unless we changed its name. Yes, no we didn't. And it represents like an unsubstituted type holder, type, type or a placeholder. And it has two things, it has an index and a name. Uh, the index is just the, essentially uh, its position in the list, right? So if we had A and B, then a would have index zero, and B would have index one, um, and the name is obviously A, a or B. <laughs> uh, and sometimes uh, that index can stretch across definitions, which is a little bit interesting. So, in fact, let's see. That usually occurs in. All right, so inside, inside this method, let's say, uh, X, Y, and Z are all in scope. So what will happen is that X has index zero, Y has index one, and Z has index two, even though it's the first one in this list. Um, so the list of when you when you actually look at the generics of a particular item, like the generic things that are generic parameters defined on a particular item, like this method, uh, you'll see that it has a parent. I'll show you in a second. Um, so it kind of inherits. It can inherit generics from its parent and then extend them further with, with new generic definitions. Um, so that's how this works. And. Uh, well, so when we're inside the definition, we'll actually just work with these parameters types as if they were real types, right? Um, we'll treat them like any other type. But when we come, um, when, when we want to pull something that was inside a definition out and use it from the outside, we have to do what's called a substitution. So let me give an example. So imagine that we had this struct foo when it has a, uh, a, a field of type vec of a, And then, now, the type, the type of this field is going to be an ADT of vec. Like, if you ask, this, this field has a def ID. Let me back up a second. Well, no, let me not do that. Got a little detail. The type of this field, and I'll explain in a second how you would get that type, is, but when we do get it, it's going to be stored as an ADT. That's because it's a reference to a vector. And that's the ADT def is vec. And then the list of substituted types is going to be the first parameter, which corresponds to A, right? Um, but now imagine that we were accessing that field 
from well, actually, even from here. But let's let's make a separate example. Make it a little clearer. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so imagine we were accessing. We want to know what we're trying to figure out is what is the type of this expression foo dot x, and if we just read the type of that field, we would get sort of that directly. And that doesn't make sense because this parameter isn't even like we don't have any generic parameters in our current scope. It's, it's like a, a namespacing violation. So what we want to do is we want to take the type of foo. So here the type of foo is going to be this, which is to say it has a slice with u32 as the substitution. And we want to replace the corresponding indices. Actually, foo had two arguments, so let's let's add that in there. Um, so basically, we want to walk down this. We want to get the type of the field, like from here. Walk down it, and each place we see a parameter, take the index, index into that list of substitutions, and replace it. Right. So that would substituting here would give us back of u32, which is the correct type. Um, and that. That transformation is called substituting. And there's a substitutor method. Um, oh, hold on. Yeah, it's called sub. So let me, I'll we'll come back to how that actually happens in one second. Let me just talk about the types of fields. So, what I wanted to mention is that if the field has a def ID, let's make this a little clear, you can say, you can use this type of query to say, give me the type of this field. And that's how I would actually get this type out. And it's gonna that type of query is quite flexible. You can use it on any any def ID that has a type associated with it. So for example, I could even add, I could ask for what is the type of this struct, and that would give me um, it kind of gives me the like identity type of the struct. That's just by definition, like we just decided it's just convenient as it happens. Um, you can ask a struct for its type, and you'll get back this identity, sort of the internal view of the declaration, so to speak, uh, and so forth. Right? Um, but one of the things you can ask for the type of is a field. And in all cases, when you do that, you get this view with using that is in terms of the generics that are in scope. And then you have to translate it to your particular scope where you've got values for those generics. Um, so far, following along? OK. So this subs method, let's talk about that. Let me find an actual call to it. Uh, um, here's one. OK, this is like a totally random piece of code, but that's OK. Um, so. So if we look at, for example, oh, OK. My checkout is a little out of date. Let me find another place. OK, shouldn't have it. Sure. Actually, I'll do that. Uh, let's do this. One second. OK, here we go. Um, here's an example of doing these substitutions that I've been talking about. Let me put a link to this for future reference. Um, so, so what is happening here? So, this is this is not too. What this code is actually doing is converting, as it happens, from the here the syntax of a type to the semantic view of a type. So it's kind of doing this translation. That's not so important. Um, but suffice to say, it gets somehow a list of substitutions that are to be applied. And then you can see it calls type of, just like I said, for a given def ID. And that's going to give us the self view. And then it applies this subs method 
applies those substitutions and that'll make that'll actually do the substitution and, and now what you might wonder is what is this how does this subs method work what is it defined on um, so it turns out you want to be able to do these substitutions for a whole bunch of things like you want to be able to apply them to a type but you also might want to be able to apply them say to a struct with a bunch of types in it um, and apply the substitution to all the types in the struct or a vector of types. It's kind of like a map. You want a sort of map operation where you can find all the types that appear inside of some thing in the compiler and, and substitute them and change their view. And we have, a th we have a trait for that. It's called type foldable. Even though this is sort of a map, we call it type foldable. I don't know. Feels like the right name. But what it means is it's any type that implements type foldable is basically something that embeds types or regions, and it allows you to walk itself and, and translate them, right? Um, so let me jump back to my thing. So this is the type foldable section. So the idea is there's actually two parts to the way type foldable works. There's something called a type folder, and the type folder is defines what you want to do to every type. It's like the closure that you might give to a map if you were using, um, and my analogy is like uh, vector.iter.map. So if we do this, we, we walk over the vector, we apply something to every element. This, this closure is kind of the folder, analogous to the folder. Right? Um, And this, the definition of map, is sort of analogous to the type foldable. Uh, so the folder has a few methods you can see here. Um, not too many. There's kind of one for every core sort of thing. It's basically every kind of generic parameter <laughs> that Rust, the language, defines, and some that it doesn't define yet. So there, there are types, regions, which is another name for a lifetime and constants for when we support const generics. Uh, so what's going to happen, and binders, I'm going to ignore for the moment, <laughs> but they're, they're, um, they're another place that you get to intercept. So what's going to happen is that when you have a type foldable, it's going to walk itself and invoke the meth and sort of recursively apply until it, recursively fold until it gets down to a, to a type or a region or a constant and then invoke the type folder to do some processing. Um, so in the case of substitution, this is, oops, not that wrong thing. In the case of substitution, uh, oh, damn it. <laughs> that just looks like the place I want to click. Here we go. The actual folder is just going to be doing that indexing that I talked about. You can actually see it here. So we define the folder here. It's a struct. It's called a subst folder. We, we call it fold with, which means process my, basically the map operation, process myself and, um, uh, and invoke the folder methods as appropriate. And if you skim down to like fold tie, this is the method that, that processes each type. And you see that it looks, it says, aha, uh -huh, this is a parameter type. In that case, I'm going to replace it with something from the list of substitutions. And otherwise, I'm going to recursively process the type. So I'll come back to this in a second. Um, but the replacing it this is calling this tie for param method. And all that does um, is to basically index into the list of substitutions with the index of the parameter. Uh, the rest of this stuff is basically all error recovery so that in case something goes wrong, we get a nice message that can help us figure out what the heck happened. Um, but effectively, um, sort of morally, what's happening is something like match t.sty. If it's a param, take the index and replace it with subs of index. Um, the, so let me come back to this now, but then look, let's 
So what is this super fold width and what's happening there? Um, so, so when you define a type foldable, this is what a typical type foldable might look like. And actually there's a shorthand that we can use to sort of derive it, um, but we'll come back to that. So like, so imagine I have a struct that has a def ID of something and a type in it, and I wanna make it type foldable. And that would mean that if I had a my struct instance, I would be able to do my struct.subst, for example, and apply a substitution. I, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the compiler that just works on any type foldable thing. So it would, it would be compatible with all of that. Um, what I really do is I just define, actually there's two methods. I left off one of them. I'm gonna ignore it for the moment. I define this super fold width. And we're kind of uh, emulating an OO setup to a certain extent. So there's a fold width, the actual trait has a fold width method. And the default thing that it does, if I'm not mistaken, is to call super fold width immediately. Um, and so you don't, normally you just define super fold width, but you don't normally invoke it most of the time. And what it will, what super fold width will do is recursively descend through your fields and process, um, and, and recursively process them. So this, this split gives you some ability to say like, maybe I wanna do something at the struct level, like maybe I can replace the entire struct without substituting its fields individually, in which case I, that's what fold width at the top level method would do. But otherwise the super fold width says, no, I just wanna replace, I wanna go and replace my fields but the struct, I just want to build back up from the replaced version of each field. Right? And for almost all types, these are the same because you don't want to intercept at the top level. The main difference, the only real case where we use the super is types and regions. And basically the things that the folder itself operates on. Because now the folder gets a chance to intercept and replace the type as a whole, as in the case of substitutions, or as we also saw in substitutions, if it doesn't want to replace the type as a whole, it can go descend into the type and replace its little pieces. So an example by calling super fold width. An example where it might want to do that would be like, if I had, uh, well, if I had a type like um, vec of vec of x, right? this would be like ADT of vec, ADT of vec, uh, param x, let's say, whatever the index of x is. And so now, when I substitute, I have, this is actually my entire type. And there's no substitution to happen here, but I wanna recursively look at this inner type. Still no substitution. Recursively look at this inner type. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna replace this one with u32 or whatever, and then I'm gonna build the rest around it so that I wind up with this, right? Um, uh, and that's what's going to happen when I call super. Uh, one last thing I'll mention. So if we look in the structural impulse, um, let's see. Where is this? Mm. I was so this 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 file structural impulse.rs happens to contain a lot of type foldable definitions, so you can kind of see how they look. Um, sometimes, like this one, ADT def. This is actually an interesting example. You can see that fold width doesn't do anything at all. It's just the identity function, and the reason for that is essentially if the, the intuition you should think of is if I were substituting things to go from the self view to, to the outside view, would I want to replace types that appear inside of here or not? And an ADT def is basically just the name. Like we said that logically it represents the name of the struct, like vec. And you never change that when you substitute. Right? The vec is always a vec. Um, it's only these, so that's why it doesn't get changed uh, as you fold it. Um, then we have some things like this will fold a tuple of other foldable things, right? and it just recursively recurses down. Um, and these macros, these are what I wanted to refer to, to highlight. 
So for technical crappy reasons, we can't use derive in the compiler itself yet. This is because of the bootstrapping cycle. We are, I think, actually maybe close to solving that. I'm not sure. But so we end up writing these macro rules definitions instead that are sort of like derive. And this is one that handles the pain of implementing type foldable for some kind of enum. So in this case, you write enum type foldable impl, and then you can list out the variants. And it's going to generate the glue code that's like match on self, if it's a sum, recursively process, you know, all that stuff. Um, and one annoying thing is that often we don't get all the edge cases right when we write these macro rules because we're lazy. Uh, so like enums work for parenthesized lists of fields, but they might not work for named enums with named fields. And so sometimes you'll see manual impulse that don't seem like it seems like you should be able to derive it, but you can't because uh, it just doesn't quite fit what the macro is made to do. And that's annoying, but here's a case for like a brace struct. So this hap this thing is a struct with three fields. I can write brace struct type foldable and I don't have to write all the glue code. I just have to list out the fields. Um, let me copy these links. What the science was supposed to say. Um, it would be really nice. Like, definitely, we've long wanted to be able to apply derive and just, uh, just get rid of these. Um, get the idea. What one other one I'll mention is. Yeah, okay. So all these types, I mentioned that if there is, if nothing needs to happen during substitution, if you just want to copy it over, um, that's an easy case. And all of these types are examples where there's really no sub substitution to be done. And that's why this clone thing just says, just clone it. That's all you got to do. Um, Uh, I think we already covered this. All right, so we, we're running out of time. I will uh, let's take a vote. Should I try to talk about inference and the two levels of the arena table, or is that too much? And we should leave it for another time. <laughs> if you think it's I, too much, I have two small questions regarding what we just talked about. All right, go for it. Uh, one is um, you mentioned uh, enhancing or handling for substitution. Uh, the obvious case I can think of is trying to substitute uh, something with a list and you have a, like an index out of bounds situation. Uh, other than that, is there any other failure uh, for substitution? Uh, yeah, there, there could be. You could pass a type where a region was expected or vice versa. Um, and usually that would be a compiler programmer error. No, always, uh, always. always. Wait. So yeah, that, well, yes, always. So it's possible. I mean, it might, it might be that the user wrote something wrong. Like they might have written, let's go down here. Um, they might have written like back of tick A or something. Like, and that would be just wrong. But what should have happened is that we should have intercepted that earlier when we were translating from syntax to semantics and substituted a dummy something uh, such that it made sense. And we actually have a special type called error, for example that is, would be used in situations like this, where it's like, I, there was a bug, or the user did something dumb, and I'm just putting this in there. And the idea for that is that then you should suppress downstream errors. Like, if you see an error, you don't have to report. You can just pretend it was, everything was good, because. Uh, but, right, so that should be handled earlier. So if you see it at this late stage, then somebody mixed up something. That's, that's a bug. Um, and the second small question was, you mentioned several times uh, the self view versus the outside view. Can you please clarify what you meant by that? Yeah, that's kind of my intuitive name for it. Um, but what I meant was self view is, I mean like inside the struct definition, for example. So it's basically the when, when the generics are in scope and you have to treat them as placeholders, that's what I mean by self view. And then the outside view would be when, well, for example, here, when I'm reaching in to get the type of a field, but I'm not, the generics are not in scope now uh, that are 
The generics on that type are not in scope. So I should be substituting them. And there's actually a little bit of a, like the impl is an interesting case because it's an outside view from the point of view of the fields of the struct actually, but an inside view from these generics here, right? That's why I gave them different letters to emphasize that indeed, uh, although there is a parameter with index zero in scope in both places, it's logically a distinct type. And so a common failure is to forget to do substitution. And if you do that, sometimes it might go unnoticed for a while because you just happen to have the same set of things in scope. Um, and it's only when you're writing more complex examples that you realize you've got something wrong. So. All right, I think it's a good place to stop. We won't cover, we will, we'll get to the inferencer another time. Uh, uh, any parting questions then? Thank you, Nico. I was a little confused by something. Can you clarify? Um, when you're talking about the type foldable impulse and you said we treat ADT defs completely opaquely. So what I'm confused by is, okay, if that were a struct, why aren't we recursing to all of its fields? So the ADT def, two reasons. It's a good question. Um, the answer is, Because, basically because you don't, you, I'm trying to think how to answer this. There's like a couple of different directions to answer it. W one way to view it is because we don't. <laughs> and what we do instead is when you extract the type of the field, you, you substitute it then, right? So I guess that there would be two possible options. You could, you could say that the ADT def is like a structural description of the field of the fields and variants. And so in that case, it's not just a name of the struct, it's like more like here's the data of the struct and you would want to substitute it then because it should represent the view. But what we actually say is that it's really just the name and that, so it, it goes, it never changes. The types in there are always with the consistent uh, view of being inside. They always have the self view, so to speak. And that, that you just have, you have to know that and know that when you extract them out, they will be, you need to apply substitution. Um, there's a sort of deeper okay. reason for that, that there's this term nominal and structural type systems. Uh, like where this is a nominal type system, which means basically that exactly this, basically, that you pass around, you reference structs by name and not two structs that have different names, even if they have the same fields are distinct structs. Um, and, so when you take that approach, you generally would, would not do the substitution on the name itself. Instead, you will, I guess one way to think of it is, you could think of it as just efficiency also, right? Like the only thing that can change inside of VEC is the type parameters defined on the VEC, right? Like if we're substituting, if we have some VEC of, VEC of U32 and it has all, or you have, you have a VEC of T type and it has a bunch of references to T all throughout, let's say a whole bunch of fields. I mean, let me make a more, tying it to VEC is maybe confusing. Um, so imagine I have like a struct, my struct, right? And it has a T and I have hundreds of fields, each of which is like VEC of T or something, right? If I were to apply the substitution deeply, I would have to replace the T in all of those fields eagerly every time. But, it, but if I do it lazily, then I keep my struct the same and I just substitute once the value, like I have a reference somewhere mm -hmm. uh, to my struct of A, so some other generic A and I substitute that to my struct of B. I'm only changing this one type once, right? And it's only when I actually pull the field out that I, that I would have to do any work. Because um, kind of the only thing that can change between these is, is all summarized right there. That make, make sense? Yeah, yeah, that does make sense. Thanks. Okay. Any more questions? Once, twice, three times. Okay, cool. You can always ping me if something comes up. Uh, thanks, everybody. And we'll talk, uh, talk on Zulu. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks thank you. Thank you.